I think we have to begin, Madhuji. Yeah, yes, Maharaj, I think um, it'll be a good to start now. Om Agyana Timurandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tathmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakaupatarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaivacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Advaita Garaha Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we're going through the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, and we're up to chapter number seven. We're hearing about scheduled incarnations of the Lord. Maharaj Parikshit had put a number of questions to Sukadeva Goswami. And Sukadeva Goswami, in order to reply to Maharaj Parikshit's, Parikshit's questions, quoted a conversation which took place between Lord Brahma and Narada Muni. And it happened that Narada Muni had put similar questions to Maharaj Parikshit. Uh, Narada Muni had put similar questions to Lord Brahma. The questions were of a similar nature to the questions put by Maharaj Parikshit. I remember Maharaj Parikshit wanted to hear about Shristi Tattva, the process of creation particularly. And so similarly, Lord Brahma, uh, Narada Muni is asking Lord Brahma about creation. And he had asked also, who is actually responsible for the creation? Are you doing it yourself or is there somebody above you? And of course, Lord Brahma replied how there's one Supreme Lord who is above him and above everyone. And that one Supreme Lord appears in many different forms. He has many different incarnations and avatars by which he appears in this world. And so we were hearing about some of the different Can can we mute, mute everyone? I'm just muting everyone, Maharaj. Yes, I'm just fine now. Can you hear me? Yes, Maharaj, we can hear you, Maharaj. Okay. So, the Lord comes in many different incarnations and Lord Brahma was describing these different incarnations. Lord Brahma, being the great soul which he is, was he knew the future. So even though Lord Brahma is speaking to Narada Muni at the beginning of the creation, he knew that in the future the Lord is going to appear in different forms and perform different pastimes. So Lord Brahma was able to describe them because he knew not only the past, but he knew present and also future. His tree Kalagya, the knower of all different phases of time. So he was able to describe the different pastimes of the Lord. And we heard about the Lord's inconceivable potencies, particularly when he comes as Lord Sri Krishna. We heard Lord Brahma describing how Lord Krishna performs most amazing pastimes to display his different inconceivable potencies. Pastimes like uh, crushing the pride of Indra by picking up the Govardhan hill, and pastimes like giving pleasure to the gopis, the cowherd ladies of Vrindavan, by dancing in the forest of Vrindavan in the night. And then 
we're hearing also up here, we're up to text number 34, 35, we're hearing about different demons, uh, asuras, who had been killed by Lord Krishna and how they all benefited by Lord Krishna. That some were liberated to the spiritual world and others entered into the impersonal Brahma Jyoti. So although they were killed by the Lord, they were benefited because they got a better position. They were put into the higher places within the universe. Uh, not in the material world, but they entered into the, the Brahma Jyoti, the impersonal Sayuja Mukti, and some entered into his own personal planet, his own abode. So this is the nature of the Lord's compassion upon the, these souls. Uh, are you able to see the text which I have on the screen? Yes, Father. Okay, so I'm reading from text number 35. It's mentioned there. Uh, All persons who participated in the battle of Kurukshetra or otherwise with the Lord or with Baladev, etc., would benefit by attaining spiritual existence according to the situation of their minds at the time of death. Those who recognize the Lord would enter Vaikuntha, and those who estimated the Lord as only a powerful being would attain salvation by merging into the spiritual existence of the impersonal Brahma Jyoti of the Lord. But every one of them would get, would get release. Every one of them would get release from material existence. Since such is the benefit of those who played with the Lord inimically, one can imagine what would be the position of those who devotedly served the Lord in transcendental relationship with Him. So Prabhupada in, in that sentence, final sentence, is encouraging all of us in our devotional service. If those people who were the inimical and who were against the Lord and fighting with him as his enemies, if they all got that kind of liberation, then certainly those who serve the Lord with love will be greatly benefited. So then we hear about other incarnations of the Lord. One next one discussed here in text number uh, 36, we hear about Srila Vyasa Dev. And Srila Vyasadeva, of course, performed very important service in writing, having the Vedic literatures all written down because he knew Kali Yuga was coming and it would be difficult for people, short memories and short lives. So he had everything written down. He also divided the Vedas into four and then he wrote also his uh, supplements to the Vedas, the Puranas and the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is considered to be the fruit of all the Vedas. Prabhupada writes here in the purport 36, here in Brahma mentions the future compilation of Srimad Bhagavatam for the short-lived persons of the Kali Yuga. And then Prabhupada goes on speaking about the short the small intelligence of people in the Kali Yuga with short lives, were lazy and so on, many bad qualities. So to be compassionate on us, Srila Vyasadeva compiled the Vedic literature, uh, well, the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is easier to understand than the, the Vedas. And also easier to get devotion from. The Veda is very difficult to get devotion from. And a little more in the purport there, if noted. But the Lord, as the compassionate Father of all living beings, imparts unto them the vast Vedic knowledge in short treatises like Bhagavad Gita and for the graduates, the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then he adds the Puranas and Mahabharata are also similarly made by Vyasadeva for different types of men in the modes of material nature, but none of them are independent of the Vedic principles. 
Yeah, people are often fond of reading things like Mahabharata. However, Jiva Goswami points out, he said, nobody ever got Krishna Prem from reading Mahabharata. Mahabharata, people enjoy hearing the different leelas and the different pastimes and events. But Mahabharata, it's a lot of karmakanda things in there in Mahabharata. But the essence, the main part of the Mahabharata is the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is important and all the great Acharyas, they comment on Bhagavad Gita and even Shankaracharya, he also has his commentary on Bhagavad Gita. All right, and then the next incarnation uh, we'll hear about is, uh, that's Lord Buddha. But you, you shouldn't, the Buddha mentioned in this purport of 37, it's a different Buddha from the Buddha in this Kali Yuga. So Jiva Goswami said this is another, a different Kali, different Kali Yuga. There are many Buddhas, right? So this one is mentioned here that uh, the Lord influenced the minds of the atheistic people. He got them to stop killing all the people on other planets. But he did it by preaching sub-religious principles. So Buddhism is, a, is actually a, an atheistic philosophy. There's no real concept of God there in the Buddhist teaching. Simply speaking about be good, don't do harm to others and so on. So I've noted a little bit of the purport here. Prabhupada wrote, but before learning these principles of non-violence, one has to learn two other principles, namely to be humble and to be prideless. Unless one is humble and prideless, one cannot be harmless and non-violent. And after being non-violent, one has to learn tolerance and simplicity of living. One must offer respects to the great religious preachers and spiritual leaders and also train the senses for controlled action, learning to be unattached to family and home and in acting devotional service to the Lord, etc. So Srila Prabhupada very nicely describes here how by practicing something like Buddhism, it can help one to come closer to understanding the higher purpose of religion, cultivating the mode of goodness, learning tolerance and simplicity, learning to offer respects to others. The, the problem is that people who practice this thing, they have no concept of God. And there are cultures in the world where people have no concept of God. Countries where Buddhism is very prominent, they have no understanding, no thought of God. They think the only religion which has God is Christianity. So I have experience, you know, people think that whenever you speak about God, you must be a Christian. They, they do not understand that in, in a very culture, there is God also. There's a Supreme Lord, there's Parameshwar over everything. I see someone's got their hand up. Is, is that, a, do you have a question, is it, Madhiji, Diksha? Yes, Madhiji. Yeah, we can ask. We cannot hear you, Maharaji. Your voice is not clear at all. Duty Gopi. Yes, Maharaji. What are we going to do? Um, Diksha Maharaji, please, uh, please write a uh, question in the comment box. Maharaji, I will ask at the end. 
I will ask at the end. Okay. We'll wait till the end. What is this? All right. So, after describing about Lord Buddha, then the next person we hear about is Kauki. Lord Chaitanya is not mentioned. Lord Chaitanya is covered avatar. He he's mentioned, but in the eleventh canto, not in this canto. Lord Chaitanya is a very confidential avatar because he comes as a devotee. All right. So Kauki is mentioned. How the Lord comes as Kauki and he kills all the all the demons without mercy. Then going ahead, text number thirty-nine, we hear about uh, Lord Vishnu, Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma. They are all different representations of the energy of the supreme power, the supreme Lord. So Lord Shiva is also God. He's also one aspect of the supreme Lord. Just the Lord Brahma is also empowered for the purpose of creation. So Lord Shiva is empowered. They're all representatives, they're guna avatars. They're empowered to help in the work of creation and destruction. And then Sukadeva, Lord Brahma goes on explaining that even these different potencies of the Lord are very difficult to understand that even uh, the great sages cannot understand these different potencies which the Lord has. Neither the sages born before text 41, neither I, Lord Brahma says, I, nor all the sages born before you know fully the omnipotent personality of Godhead. So what can others who are born after us know about him? And he gives the example about even the Lord himself, who comes in the form as Lord Shesha, that he's not able to reach the limit of such knowledge, although he has been, describe, he's been describing the qualities of the Lord with ten hundred faces. Ten hundred faces, meaning one thousand faces. So Lord, An Lord Ananta Shesha, residing there, and the bottom of the Garbod in the Garbodak Ocean, and the uh, celestial bed of Garbodak Shai Vishnu, it said he is, he is reciting the glories of the Lord since time immemorial, and he has never exhausted the glories of the Lord. The Lord's glories are so infinite, so uh, beyond the power of any one to complete. So Lord Shesha is described like that, that he cannot reach the limit of that knowledge of the Lord. In the purport there, there's a little section which I marked. Uh, As such, the expansions of his potencies can never be calculated by anyone, because even the personality of Godhead himself, as the incarnation of Shesha, cannot estimate the potencies, although he has been describing them continuously with his one thousand faces. So then Lord Brahma goes on to describe, then who can actually know about the Lord? Is it possible for anyone to actually know about the Lord? And so he, he says, those who surrender unto the Lord, they can know about the Lord, they can understand him. But those who are still in the bodily concept of life, they will never know the Lord. Those who are attached to the body, Prabhupada writes in the purport, you can see I've marked, unless therefore one is saved from the wrong conception of the body and the soul, there is no knowledge of Godhead. And unless there is knowledge of God, all advancement of material civilization, however dazzling, should be considered a failure. 
So that's an important point to understand, that this material advancement of civilization is a failure unless there's some concept of God there within the society. Lord Brahma continues, text 43, 45, he describes, although the potencies of the Lord are unknowable and immeasurable, still, because we are all surrendered souls, we know how he acts through yoga maya potencies. And he mentions similarly, the potencies of the Lord are also known to the all-powerful Lord Shiva king of the atheistic families, namely Prahlad, Swambhu, and mentions, goes on to mention the names of so many great devotees. So these, do, these people whose names are met, they, they all know the potencies of the Lord. How do they know? Because they have surrendered to the Lord. So because they are surrendered souls, everything is revealed to them. Prabhupada says, one should gain knowledge by surrendering unto the Lord and by acknowledging the authority of the persons mentioned herein. The Lord is unlimited and by the grace of the Yoga Maya helps the surrendered souls to know Him proportionately with the advance of one's surrender. So it's the, the point again, come, it comes up again and again, surrender. Yes, we have to surrender. Oh, I'm muted. Can you hear me? Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Yes, yes Yes, when did when did I get muted? Have you been hearing me all along, or I got muted? Yes, Maharaj. When you ended, yes, Maharaj. Just just the last Maharaj. sentence, please, Maharaj. Oh, okay. All right. So then, so, uh, Lord Brahma continues. He gave the name of great devotees who have surrendered, and then he continues to say, even the sinful people. Even sinful people from sinful lives, from sinful civilizations, they can also know about the glories of the Lord. They can also become liberated simply by surrendering unto the pure devotees of the Lord and by following in their footsteps in devotional service. So this is an important point. that. Birth is not important. We may be coming from sinful backgrounds, whatever. But if we have, if we take shelter of the pure devotees, if we have the the, the shelter of the the Lord's devotees, then certainly we can also know the Lord. Prabhupada writes, I've marked here in this purport of text number forty six, the personality of Godhead may not be present before one's eyes. But if one is sincere in wanting such guidance, the Lord will send a bona fide person who can guide one properly back home, back to Godhead. There is no need of material qualification for making progress on the path of spiritual realization. So, this is very important, we should understand material qualifications. They may, they may help, but they may not. The problem is sometimes people who have material qualifications are very attached and very proud of their material qualifications. But it's not a necessity that you have to have material qualifications. As we heard, Earlier, it's important to be without pride and to be humble. These kind of qualities are important. But if one is proud of material learning, knowledge, then it's not good. 
So we see examples, of course, in our scriptures. We have examples of people coming from uh, different backgrounds, people like hunters, like Magrari could become a hunter. Then Haridas Thakur was from the Mohammedan family, but he became a great devotee. And even prostitutes, they also became devotees by the association of Haridas Thakur. So, there are many examples. Mm. Oh, there's a bit more in this purport. That's an important purport, 46. The bona fide representative of God is as good as God himself. Or, in other words, the loving representative of the Lord is more kind and more easy to approach. A sinful soul cannot approach the Lord directly, but such a sinful soul or man can very easily approach a pure devotee of the Lord. And if one agrees to put himself under the guidance of such a devotee of the Lord, he can also understand the science of God and can also become like the transcendental pure devotee of the Lord, and thus get liberation back to Godhead, back home, for eternal happiness. Can you give some examples of sinful people who became devotees by the mercy of a devotee? Jagai, Jagai. Jagai Madai, who did they become devotees? Whose mercy did they get? Yes. Brigari Maharaji. Huh? Brigari. Brigari. Yes, Makrari. Whose mercy did he get? Narad Muni. Okay. And Balmiki. Balmiki. Yeah. Whose mercy did he get? Narad Muni again. Narad Muni. Okay. Someone else? Sinful people. The residents of where? Jangal Pradesh. Oh. What dash? Jangal Pradesh. Oh, jungle, jungle Pradesh, okay. Yes, they were all Aborigine people, huh? Thank you, Sam Maharaj. Even these hippies of the Western world. Yes. Many hippies, young people in the Western world have had sinful lives and they got the mercy of Srila Prabhupada. And we, and we all people who sure were attending the classes, most of us, at least me. Yes. It's your kind association. Yeah, we're coming from sinful lives, sinful backgrounds, sinful paths, somehow, by the mercy of the devotee. We see also materialistic people like Dhruva Maharaj. He got the mercy of Narada Muni. He became purified. Maharaj Dhritarash got the mercy of Vidur. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dhritarashtra. <laughs> What he was not able to take full advantage of Vidura's mercy, but to some extent, yeah, he got at least out of his situation. He got he was able to be determined enough to go out of the home, to leave the home, and to endeavor for the ultimate perfection. So that was good. Yes, he took 
he took the instructions of Vidura seriously and he was able to go out of the home. He wasn't able to fully surrender to the Lord, but he was able to at least get out from his material situation and to detach himself from that. So that was good. Mm. I have a question here. Can I ask now what is here? All right, you can ask. There is a and when the Prabhupada gave instructions to his disciples, they do, they took it so seriously and is their life and soul. So Maharaj, we have also come in contact with such pure devotees. So, but why, uh, like we see them, all the Maharaj or our disciples, like your divine grace also, that you do not waste even a single moment. But when I take it for myself, I feel that uh, for me, uh, I'm so conditioned that I'm not able to use each and every moment of my life nicely in the service of Prabhupada. So, Maharaj, like uh, we have been benefited by the mercy of a pure devotee. But uh, will we be ever, will I be ever like this? to utilize each and moment, each every moment, like Maharaj and Prabhupada disciples do. So I just have a doubt in this. Well, you have to be patient. You have to understand that devotional service is, requires practice. I don't know how long you've been practicing Krishna consciousness, but gradually as you go on, then devotional service does tend to intensive, become more intensified. Uh, one devotee he gave the example, he said, just like if you're running in a marathon race, a marathon race, you know, you may run, but if you've trained for the race, then when it comes to the near the end, then you want to put on a final spurt, you know, you want to really give everything to try to get the best time you can and to get the best place you can. So you, as you get older, you put more and more effort into concentrating your devotional service. Because we know that the body is not eternal, so our time is limited. And we saw that with Srila Prabhupada that Srila Prabhupada knew that his time left in the material world was limited. And so he gave everything to, by way of writing his books and pushing the devotees to establish the Krishna consciousness movement. So gradually, as you get older, we hope you will also intensify your own devotional service. Now you're just a young woman and you know, you have other, certainly other things you have to do. You're not able to commit yourself fully. But we hope gradually as you go on, you will commit yourself more fully to Krishna consciousness. You understand? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, and uh, I wanted, thank you so much, Maharaj, for giving me this hope. Thank you. I have to intensify being now older and older. I have to see how I can intensify my practices. <coughs> I wanted to ask, like, you told, uh, the Divine Grace told that uh, Lord Buddha, uh, Lord Buddha is, does not give any devotional path. So, Maharaj, why do we worship him in the ten incarnations of the Lord? Well, the point is that the people who followed that Buddha, they were liberated because they, they didn't understand God, but they had deep faith in the Buddha and they followed the Buddha. So Prabhupada said it was the trick of the Lord, that he tricked them. You, you just follow me. You don't believe in the Vedas. You don't believe in God. It's okay. You just follow me. And so they followed the Buddha. And by following the Buddha, then they got Krishna consciousness because they're following th that Buddha, that one Buddha who was the incarnation of Lord Krishna, they got the ultimate benefit. So 
he is one of the avatars. He is, he is, he is mentioned there in the Vedic scriptures. It's mentioned there. And so Srila Jayadeva Goswami, when he was writing, you know, he selected these different avatars. Yes, Maharaj. And Maharaj, like you mentioned, uh, Buddha, uh, then, then the followers of Buddha took to Krishna consciousness. So initially they were all the, uh, they were killing and doing this for rapidly. But later they followed Krishna consciousness just by following Buddha. But Buddha was not preaching this at that time. He was just preaching that we non-violent and humble. So. Yes, Buddha didn't preach anything. He didn't preach Krishna consciousness. He just taught them follow me right he taught them follow me he taught them you know don't stop all the stop stop all the bad activities don't do harm to any other living entities respect all forms of life he, so he taught them you know what we would call material piety the path of material pious activities which certainly help to elevate people to the mode of goodness. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much. And Maharaj, in the first, first sloka you mentioned today in the class, in the back, uh, mentioning that in the battle of Kurukshetra, those devotees, those people who saw Krishna, uh, who were killed, and the way they saw Krishna reciprocated the, that way. So Maharaj, in that it was mentioned that uh, material existence was completely eradicated for both of them. But Maharaj, how how that person who goes back, goes to Brahma Jyoti and then again comes back, he, does he not come back to material existence again? Yeah, he will. Yeah. He'll come back to material existence again. You're right. So for some time, he'll Maharaj, go, for some time he'll go to the Brahma Jyoti, he'll stay there but not forever. After some time he become restless because his nature, his, his full nature has not been realized. So he will attain to the impersonal Brahma Jyoti and remain there for some time, maybe for a long time, and eventually come back again to the material world until he has to become properly situated. So although he's liberated, the liberation is just theoretical, it's not factual liberation. Liberation for some time, but not actually total liberation. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Okay. All right, we'll go ahead. So text 47 describes more about the position of the Supreme Lord. Uh, text 48 is an interesting text. You want to look at it. Uh, it mentions about how devotees, that uh, a devotee, we don't have to worry about con artificial control of the mind or mental speculation, or meditation. That's the business of the jnanis and the yogis. But for the devotees, these activities are not important. And Lord Brahma gives a very nice example, which you should be aware of. He says, uh, one gives up such processes as the heavenly king Indra forgoes the the trouble to dig a well. <laughs> now, um, the example is very nice, you know, in, King Indra is the god of rain. So the god of rain, he doesn't have to worry about digging a well for water. He's the god of rain and all the clouds are under his control. And so there's no question of Indra worrying about getting water. That's always available for King Indra. So the same way for a devotee, a devotee doesn't have any need to tr do this artificial control of the mind and meditation and speculation. 
devotees already achieved the results of all these things by devotional service. Anything which is, which is, which is a benefit from these activities, it's already there by dint of practicing bhakti yoga. So, Lord Brahma gives this very nice example. He said, just like Indra doesn't need to dig a well, Okay, and then uh, every individual living into, uh, after the annihilation of the material body, living, like the air within the body, the living entity exists exactly like the air within the body. And so another example was given there in 49, that the living entity exists because the living entity's nature is spiritual. So even when the body is annihilated, the living entity continues. And the example is just like the air within the body. So the body may be a dead body, but the air in the body, the air will remain, will continue. So Lord Brahma is concluding his teachings to Narada Muni here, and he's telling him, I have now I've now explained to you, I've explained in brief the Supreme Personality of Godhead who is creating this manifested world. Without him, there are no other causes of the phenomenal and non and, and the phenomenal and noumenal existence. So Prabhupada writes in the purport, this does not mean, however, that the Lord himself is distributed impersonally. So this point, of course, is coming up again and again in Prabhupada's writing. He wants us to understand very clearly that the Lord is a person, but at the same time he has impersonal energy. He does have an impersonal energy. It's not that he's not impersonal, but his ultimate characteristic is personal. In the purport, Prophet also says, one should not deprecate the Supreme Lord for the creation of the miserable world, just as one should not blame the king for creating a prison house in the government. The prison house is necessary. In every country in the world, you need to have prison houses. You've got people who don't want to follow the laws, who don't want to cooperate with the government. And so you have to arrange for that. So the, the, the prison house is a necessarily necessary part of the, every country. In the same way, the material world is a part of the creation of the Lord. And Prabhupada says at the end of the purport, he said, since he has no direct attachment to this material world, he is not to be blamed for its creation. <laughs> we, want, we always look to, to blame someone, you know, oh, it's his fault, why did he do this, why did he make this material world? But the material world is arranged it's simply for us. That we desired, we desired to live in this material world, in in a rebellious nature, to live away from the plan of the Lord. So the material world is created for us. And then, text number fifty-one, Lord Brahma gives instruction to Narada Muni. He, he he's telling Narada Muni. Please expand the science yourself. So you can see the instruction is coming from Lord Brahma that he wants Narada Muni to distribute this knowledge of Krishna consciousness, to distribute this message of Srimad Bhagavatam. So this is an important statement here coming from Lord Brahma. He's asking Narada Muni, you please ex expand, do it yourself. Ivam etad vibhuli kuru. 
the science of Godhead expand. Vipuli, Vipuli Kuru, Twamitad Vipuli Kuru, expand. So Prabhupada was always eager, we should expand the Krishna consciousness movement. He would like to see new centers opened. He would like to see more uh, books distributed. He would like to see more festivals going on. He wanted to see propaganda. So this is the instruction of Lord Brahma to Narada Muni. And we're following the same thing through the Jasipit succession. Try to expand this knowledge of the Supreme Lord. In other words, distribute it. In the Purport, Prabhupada writes, the Bhagavad Purana is therefore the direct incarnation of the Lord in the form of transcendental sound. And one should receive this transcendental knowledge from the bona fide representative of the Lord in the chain of cyclic succession from the Lord to Brahma. And then from Brahma to Narad, from Narad to Vyas, from Vyasa Dev to Sukadeva Goswami, Sukadeva Goswami gave it to Sutta Goswami, and this way the knowledge is passed. Prabhupada says, it's not like you get the fruit and you just drop it down to the ground. It's a delicate mango fruit, so it has to be handled carefully. So it's passed from teacher to students like that. So that it's not going to be damaged, it's not going to be adulterated. It must be passed very carefully. So this is the process of simply succession. So we, you can understand how important it is for us to preach and distribute Krishna consciousness. It's the instruction Lord Brahma gave to Narada. Lord Brahma is our Adi Guru. All right, then continuing here, we have text number 51, is it? 50, oh, 52. 52. Brahma is speaking to Nara. He wants to please describe the science of Godhead with determination and in a manner to which it will be quite possible for the human being to develop transcendental devotional service unto the personality of Godhead Hari, the super soul of every living being and the summon bonum source of all energies. So Brahma is making the point that uh, it should be presented in a manner which people can understand it, that they can develop their transcendental consciousness. That's important. Sometimes people present they will speak philosophy nobody can understand. And we'll just read a little bit, this part here from the purport, the second paragraph. Srimad Bhagavatam is so scientifically presented that any sincere student of this great science will be able to understand the science of God simply by reading it with attention or simply by regularly hearing it from the bona fide speaker. Everyone is hankering after happiness in life, but in this age the members of human society, blind as they are, do not have the proper vision that the Personality of Godhead is the reservoir of all happiness, because He is the ultimate source of everything. Happiness in complete perfection, without hindrance, can be achieved only by our devotional relationship with Him. And it is only by His association that we can get free of distressful material existence. Even those who are after the enjoyment of this material world can also take shelter of the great signs of Srimad Bhagavatam and they will be successful at the end. Narada is therefore requested or ordered by his spiritual master to present this science with determination and a good plan. Narada was never advised to preach the principles of Bhagavatam 
to earn a livelihood. He was ordered by his spiritual master to take the matter very seriously in a missionary spirit. Powerful writing by Srila Prabhupada guiding us to understand the mood in which Lord Brahma is instructing Narada here. And here's the final verse of this chapter. The Lord's activities in association with his different energies should be described, appreciated and heard in accordance with the teachings of the Supreme Lord. If this is done regularly with devotion and respect, one is sure to get out of the illusory energy of the Lord. Uh, a, little, a few points in the purport I've noted. Uh, on the other hand, those who do not complete, who are, not, who are not completely free from the clutches of the Lord's external energy, should devoutly hear regularly about the activities of the Lord in relation with the per, with the external energy. They should not foolishly jump up to the activities of the Lord's internal energy, falsely attracted by such activities as Rasa Lila. And then, just to finish, rather the descriptions of such activities of the Lord as the Purusha avatar are specifically meant for persons who are in the clutches of the external energy. Topics like the Rasa Lila are meant for the liberated souls and not for the conditioned souls. All right, so that's the end of that chapter. Are there any more questions on this chapter before we go on to chapter number eight? Thank you, Samara. Okay, then we can take a break for five minutes. Have a break for five minutes and then we'll go on.
Okay, is everyone there? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Okay, so we'll begin again. We're, we're going on to chapter number 8, Questions by King Parikshit. So we had, earlier we had questions by King Parikshit, and so he has more questions. We should note, it's a duty it's the business of the disciple, right? Tarvidi pranipadena pari prashnena sevaya. So devotees like to put questions, and the inquisitive student will like to put questions before the spiritual teacher. So Maharaj Parikshit is a highly inquisitive student, and he has a lot of questions. And you can, we're going to see some of the questions, the questions he asks in this chapter are really deep <laughs> and just hearing the questions it's uh, quite bewildering. All right, so first of all, text number one. King Parikshit inquired from Sukadeva Goswami, how did Narada Muni, whose hearers are as fortunate as those instructed by Lord Brahma exp explain the transcendental qualities of the Lord, who is without material qualities, and before whom did he speak? All right, so it's mentioned here that the Lord is without material qualities. So Srila Prabhupada discusses this point in the purport here about how the Lord could be without material qualities. Uh, you can see there in the second paragraph. It will appear also that the Lord existed prior to the material creation, and therefore his transcendental name, quality, etc., do not represent any material quality. Whenever, therefore, the Lord is described as aguna, or without any quality, it does not mean that he has no quality, but that he has no material quality, such as the mode of goodness, passion, or ignorance, as the conditioned souls have. He is transcendental to all material conceptions, and thus he is described as aguna. Are you hearing me okay or am I Krishna muted? Maharaj, I'm muted again, isn't it? Hare Krishna Maharaj, you are muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, Maharaj. I don't know how it happens. I don't know what happens that I get muted. Anyway, one of the inconceivable potencies of the Lord, maybe, yeah? All right, so Maharaj Parikshit continues, I wish to know narrations concerning the Lord who possesses wonderful potencies are certainly auspicious for living beings in all planets. So Maharaj Parikshit understands the potency of hearing about Lord Krishna. Certainly hearing topics of the Lord are very powerful very important, very purifying. So we try to encourage, that's why we distribute books, of course. Our purpose is to let more people also know about the pastimes and the qualities of the Lord. No, but actually people don't know until they read our books, until they get books from us. 
Then text number three. O oh, greatly fortunate Sukhdeva Goswami, please continue narrating Srimad Bhagavatam so that I can place my mind upon the Supreme Soul Lord Krishna and being completely freed from material qualities, thus relinquish this body. And so Maharaj Pariksha is very eager just to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. He has nothing further to do. He's very complete. He is completely satisfied to just absorb himself in hearing the glories of the Lord. And of course, by the grace of Krishna, he got the perfect association in the form of Sukadeva Goswami. Maharaj Pariksit fully prepared himself he gave up everything, all attachment to the material world. He did not even eat or even drink. He was completely absorbed in just simply hearing Krishna Kata from Sukadeva Goswami. So the Srimad Bhagavatam is being glorified in this first section here of the Shri, this eighth chapter. And uh, Maharaj Parikshit goes on describing about persons who hear Srimad Bhagavatam regularly and are always taking the matter very seriously will have the personality of Godhead Sri Krishna manifested in their hearts within a short time. So Srila Prabhupada writes in, the pur in one purport, he said, if you simply concentrate on reading Srimad Bhagavatam, one day you will see Krishna in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So that would be nice. You want to see Krishna? Just keep reading Srimad Bhagavatam and Lord Krishna will manifest. And certainly it's mentioned there in this section here. Text 5 continues to glorify Srimad Bhagavatam. How the sound vibration of Srimad Bhagavatam enters the heart, sits on the lotus flower of the heart of the loving relationship, cleanses the dust of material association, the lust and the anger and greed, and it acts like autumnal rains upon pools of muddy water. Who can explain this example to me? Autumnal rains upon pools of muddy water. Do you understand this example? Dhananjai, have you understood this example? Muddy water uh, stands for this material world and uh, this autumn rain is uh, because this is just uh, uh, end of uh, uh, rainy season so that uh, rain is mostly pure so this Srimad Bhagavatam is like a pure water which is falling on this uh, 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 muddy World. What happens to the muddy water when the, when it rains in the autumn? Can you tell me what happens to the muddy water when when the rains fall in autumn? Sometimes the muddy waters of the river they become at once clear. Yes, right. They become clear. When the autumn, autumnal rains, the autumn rains fall, the water is clear. And so similarly, what happens? How does this relate to Srimad Bhagavatam? When we hear the Srimad Bhagavatam, then, you know, our heart becomes clear. When it enters through our uh, ears into the heart. Right. What do, what's it? What what's removed from the heart? Oh, you know, the the anarthas which are there in the heart. Right. Yeah. Yes. The lust and the anger and the greed, these things. So the heart is the heart is cleansed, right? What's the verse in Srimad Bhagavatam describing that? Do you know a verse? First canto, second chapter? 
Nice. Uh, Shrimatam Sabatha Krishna, and then next one, Nashtabhaya Shrivatha Krishna. Yes, right, good. Yes, good. Okay. Very nice. Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, uh, this correlation, what it is given, and um, of course, this is what the conclusion we want to draw. But practically, when we see that muddy water, the rain is falling, it will get uh, further uh, muddy. How it will get clearer? Because it comes with... So that we never see it in material world. Uh, though this is the implication, we want to draw the meaning out of it. But this correlation, what it has been given, is it not, not very well fitting uh, in, in the uh, uh, this situation? What do you say? When the rain, the rain is, is, is falling on the muddy water, yes. it is further turbulence and then it will become uh, further swelled up, like it's, it's never going to get uh, clearer. Because that is what, that is where, like when you ask me, though we wanted to draw that conclusion, but basically this correlation which we are trying to find it out, it somehow it was not telling well to me, because whenever the rain is falling, water which is muddy which will get further uh, uh, steed up and it will get uh, further muddy it's never going to get uh, uh, clean because clean it happens when the water uh, settles down and mud uh, get settled down but while raining it never going to get clearer what do you say to the hari it is said in the first first paragraph uh, during the rainy season, all the waters of the rivers become muddy, as Prabhuji is mentioning. But in the month of July, August, the autumn season, when there is a slight rainfall, the muddy waters of the rivers all over the world becomes at once clear. By addition of some chemical, a small reservoir of water, like that of a metropolitan water works, tank can be cleared. But it is so he's saying that when there is a lot of rainfall, suddenly it becomes muddy. When there is slight rainfall, then gradually it starts to become clear. Ah. Do you understand Dan and Jai? Still it is practically what we see, it's like before winter, when the rain uh, falls, uh, even if it is a uh, uh, there's a pool of water which is when it is uh, not rain is falling then it is clear moment the rain falls then it we get further speed up that is what the mechanism happened so that's the reason like i asked it like it slight or anything in where the mud is settled water is uh, uh, there on the top then it is clear but any time you pour the water it is it is going to get straight it will get muddy only well, Prabhu was explaining the autumnal rains, they're very light, they're not the heavy cloud thunderstorms. So the heavy thunderstorms, yeah, the mud will come up, but with the light autumnal rains, it's not going, it will be clear water. Somehow there's, uh, uh, in real life what we see, which even uh, Prabhuji also observed, like if water is not falling, then it will be clear because mud is settled down at the bottom. But the moment there's anything falling from the top, whether it is light or heavy, it will again get speed up. That is what the mechanism, what we find it. Like even in the glass, any, anything is there, mud is, has got a higher density it will settle on the bottom, it is going to be clear. But when rain falls, again it will get speed up. So basically that is what I said that we, we deliberately wanted to draw the conclusion, the inferences, we wanted to show it over here. But the thing is the whole process, what is what we are trying to say, it is a little confusing. You are finding fault with the Srimad Bhagavatam. I am not finding fault, this is the fun <laughs> part. So the has been explained. Anyway, this example is given. You have to you have to accept the example which is given. You know, try to understand the example. You you may say, "Oh, this is not a very good example." There's something. No, I don't agree with. This is your thinking. But you think Srila Vyasadeva didn't understand this? 
many a time the uh, the whole uh, mindset and the uh, the way they thought of that is different than what we perceive but the way the worldly language which is there that is where somehow the confusion is mm. okay anyway difficult to please everyone and this verse is making the point Prabhupada's purpose said a single pure devotee of the Lord can deliver all the fallen souls of the world right that's a fact a powerful pure devotee of the Lord however can deliver not only his personal self but also many others in his association So this is the important point. Maharaj, what does, what does it mean in the second line? One who is actually in the confidence of a pure devotee. Confidence means... Well, that means you have to have taken shelter of the pure devotee. You have to be surrendered to him. Right? You have to be, be actually have a, you've approached him and you've submitted yourself to him. You're rendering service to him. And that way you're in the confidence of a pure devotee. You're hearing regularly from him. So this way you become empowered. So, how to understand it? You, you may say, oh, we, we don't get that opportunity, we don't get to be near our spiritual teacher. Certainly, I never got that opportunity really with Srila Prabhupada. But at the same time, Prabhupada always encouraged us that we could know him by his books. Oh, Krishna. Going through some power failures here, something going on, I don't know. Yes, being in the confidence of a pure devotee, it, it can be also uh, subtle, it doesn't have to be physical. Srila Prabhupada always encouraged us that we may not be very close. And Prabhupada said he also did not get much opportunity to associate with his own Guru Maharaj. But he never forgot the instructions. And, the, and Shastra also tells us a moment's association is enough. Lava Matra Sadhu Sangi. And so even the moment's association at the time of your approaching the spiritual master and accepting initiation from him, that's sufficient for perfection. And then hearing regularly, hearing his instructions, and understanding also how the disciplic succession is there, and how we're connected to all the acharyas by hearing their teachings. So if we've taken shelter, of their, if we're, and if we're inspired by their lifestyle and by their example, then certainly we have the, we're like in the confidence of a pure devotee. All right, the confidence of a pure devotee, thus empowered by one spiritual master. Yes? Maharaj, uh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, uh, would you please explain this last paragraph, purification of the heart? This. All right, let's look at it. Purification of the heart by not. Let's see. Oh, Krishna. Oh, where am I? Eight point five. Eight point five. Last paragraph. 
Yes. Oh, yeah, purification of the heart by culture of knowledge. Or mystic yoga may be all right for the time being for an individual person, but it is like the, clean, the cleansing of a small quantity of stagnant water by chemical processes. Such clarification of water may stand for the time being, and the sediments settle down. But by a slight agitation, everything becomes muddy. The idea is that devotional service to the Lord is the only method of cleansing the heart for good, whereas other methods may be superficially good for the time being. There is a risk of becoming muddy again due to agitation of the mind. Devotional service to the Lord with specific attention for hearing Srimad Bhagavatam regularly and always is the best recommended method for liberation from the clutches of illusion. And so Srila Prabhupada is describing here that the other processes like yoga and meditation and speculation may give some temporary relief, but they're not going to stop the agitated mind. Some temporary benefit may be there. But in, without coming to devotional service, you won't get the real benefit. It's only devotional service which can actually situate us, situate us firmly in connection with the Supreme Lord. Other processes, some connection, a little, some benefit, little benefits are there, but the temporary benefit. The example is given, like you put a some chemical into the water and it may cleanse the water for some time but it's not going to last forever the chemical in the water is going to dissolve and the effect will be lost after some time and you have to be go you have to go on putting more chemicals in and at some point there'll be so much chemicals the water will just be chemicals and so the pure water will be destroyed but if we hear Srimad Bhagavatam, the hearing of Srimad Bhagavatam, it has positive effect. The effect of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada mentions regularly and always, is the best me method for liberation. Because hearing Srimad Bhagavatam itself means we're on the liberated platform. And if we keep hearing it, then we will stay on the liberated platform. But the other processes, some little benefit will be there, but it's not going to keep us firmly situated. The material desires can again come up. But devotional service, as you know from Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu studies, in the Nectar of Devotion, Srila Prabhupada describes, devotional service takes away even the desire for sin. By engaging in Krishna conscious activities, even the desire for sinful activities are removed. So that is the effect of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, that it takes away even the, the thought of engaging in materialistic activities. We become so absorbed, we become so attached to hearing about Krishna and to describing the pastimes of Krishna that we forget all about the material life and material activities. Thank you, Mom. So other processes are just like clean, cleaning the, the, the tank with some chemical process. Some, for some time you can do it, then you have to do it again. But if we do devotional service, we'll be firmly situated. As Prabhupada said, there's no risk of becoming muddy again due to the agitation of the mind. All right? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, going ahead. The pure devotee of the Lord whose heart has once been cleansed by a process of devotional service never relinquishes the lotus feet of Lord Krishna for they fully satisfy him 
as a traveller is satisfied at home after a troubled journey. Oh, I can understand this. I realize this verse. You know, I've been traveling. I was there traveling with the safari group. And so we were traveling. And certainly it was very nice to be traveling. But it's very nice to also come back to Mayapur and to be here in Mayapur. When we're traveling, you know, there's always so many different problems and inconveniences. It's not so easy, as you may know. So a traveler is, is he becomes satisfied at home. So our real home is at the shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. And when we when we're situated in devotional service to the lotus feet of Krishna, then it feels natural, it feels satisfying. We're happy there. We don't want to go anywhere else. Text number seven, O learned Brahmana, the transcendental spirit soul is different from the material body. Does he acquire the body accidentally or by some cause? Will you kindly explain this? For it is known to you. So this is Maharaj Pariksha's first question here in this chapter. He wants to know about how we got the material body. What's the cause of us getting? Was it accidental? or some cause. And this question will be answered firstly in the ninth chapter. The first few verses of the ninth chapter are the response to this inquiry. In the purport there, text number seven, the last paragraph, Prabhupada writes, in the process of devotional service, the first step is to take shelter of the spiritual master and then inquire from the spiritual master all about the process. This inquiry is essential for immunity to all kinds of offenses on the path of devotional service. Ah, so we often worry about offenses, committing offenses in our devotional service. So here Srila Prabhupada said, uh, this inquiry will give us immunity to all kinds of offences. It's important for us to inquire, take shelter from the spiritual teachers and inquire. And Prabhupada can you, even if we're fixed in devotional service, like Maharaj Parikshit, he must still inquire from the realized spiritual master. And then Prabhupada continues to, to say, uh, the spiritual master must also be well versed and learned so that he may be able to answer all these inquiries from the devotees. This one who is not well versed in the authorized scriptures and not able to answer all such relevant inquiries should not pose as a spiritual master for the matter of material gain. It is illegal to become a spiritual master if one is unable to deliver the disciple. So this is an important point here Prabhupada is making, that we shouldn't try to uh, take advantage of people it's important for us to be able to satisfy everyone, all the inquiries of people. The spiritual teacher has a duty to reply to the, the questions which people may ask. Of course, the questions should be reasonable. In Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada writes about in chapter 434, questions should not be challenging and they should not be foolish. So the questions must be of a, a suitable nature for the spiritual teacher to, to answer. Chitta Hari Prabhu has a question. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, here last line says, it is illegal to become a spiritual master if one is unable to deliver the disciple. So, I was thinking that uh, how a person will think that I am able to deliver 
the other souls and that I should become the spiritual master. Was the more one advances, the more humble he becomes. So, how it will happen then? That I should become the spiritual master of my Well, the spiritual master is not eager to take disciples. But the disciple has, should be eager to get the mercy of the spiritual master. Generally, you'll see the spiritual teacher, he's not so eager just to accept the disciples. But because the disciples are very, very eager to get that shelter and to get the mercy, then the spiritual teacher may finally agree. I mean, you see, for example, people like, who was it, uh, Lokanath Goswami was a spiritual master of Naratam Das Thakur. He didn't want to accept Naratam Das Thakur, but finally he had to agree because Naratam was so insistent. So Naratam had been ordered by Lord Chaitanya and by Krishna himself that he must take Lokanath for a spiritual teacher. And so Naratam came again and again. And when Lokana saw that he was so insistent, I said, all right. <coughs> but generally, the spiritual master is not very much eager just to accept disciples. And he certainly, he's not eager to accept them just for, for some material gain. He's not thinking, oh, he's a rich man, I want to accept him as my disciple, he'll give me, he'll give me wealth. No, we, a, a spiritual teacher doesn't think like that. But he thinks that I can engage this person in the service of Krishna, that this, this person can help me in my mission to my spiritual master. And he may accept disciples with that mentality, that I can engage him positively in Krishna's service, and he will help me to push on the Krishna conscious mission. Uh, yeah, thank you, Maharaj. And Maharaj, uh, like I was thinking, that also the spiritual master does not, like on the instruction of his spiritual master only he accepts this position. Otherwise he himself doesn't feel qualified. Is it like? Yes, it's also true that he may be ordered by his spiritual master, just like it was a uh, Morari, right? Yeah. Mor uh, What's his name? Um, Morari Thakur. Charanga Thakur. Huh? Charanga Thakur. Saranga Thakur. Uh, Saranga Morari. Yes, yeah, Saranga. Saranga was ordered by Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya told him, you know, Saranga, you're an old man now. You haven't accepted any disciple. You should accept somebody. You should take someone. And so then the next, he said, okay, next person tomorrow, next person I meet, I will accept him. And so he accepted, he found the one boy who was dead, supposed to be dead, but somehow he came back to life and he became the disciple of Saranga Murari. So Saranga Thakur, that's one. They're like that, generally you'll find people are not eager to accept disciples. But sometimes people are ordered, just like some people were ordered. That, and, and Prabhupada even said some people, you know, it's, this person will have thousands of disciples. So Prabhupada had seen it. He could understand, you know, that this person has some charisma, some power, he can attract people, he'll make a lot of disciples. And they can use that charisma in the service of Lord Krishna to bring people into Krishna consciousness and engage them in Krishna's service. So it's a very positive thing. We need spiritual teachers. We do need people to take on that duty of spiritual master. We need many spiritual masters to spread the Krishna consciousness movement. Yeah? Okay, Prabhu? Yeah. Yes. Thank you much.
Okay, going ahead. So Maharaj Pariksit has many questions. There's a lot of questions here and you can see Srimad Bhagavatam, these questions will be answered. Prabhupada makes the point that these questions are not going to be answered in any order, but they will all be answered. But they won't be answered necessarily in the order in which uh, Maharaj Pariksit asked them. Okay, uh, Prabhupada writes here, Maharaj Pariksit intelligently put questions before his spiritual master for scientific understanding of the transcendental body of the Lord. So his questions are very relevant and very much appreciated by Sukadeva Goswami. You can see text number nine, he's talking about Lord Brahma was not born of a material body, uh, he's born from the lotus flower coming out of the navel. And so is there any difference between the Lord and the body of Lord Brahma? Is there any difference between them? And then he wants to know about the super soul, how he's untouched by the external energy, but he's in the heart of all living entities. He wants to know about the Virata Purush and the different planets and everything which are there and the, what is their actual position. He wants Sukadeva Goswami to explain that. So that's going to come up again. You're going to hear more about the universal form. And then he wants to know about time, the duration of time between creation and annihilation, past, present and future the difference between different living entities, the demigods, the human beings, different planets of the universe. So you can see Maharaj Pariksit's questions are, you know, a lot of questions. He wants to know about the duration of time, both short and long, as well as the beginning of time, following the course of action. Of course, there's a whole chapter in the third canto, description of time. Then he wants to know about uh, the different modes of material nature, how they act upon the living entity, how they degrade him or elevate him. Uh, in the purport there, I've noted a section here, Prabhupada writes, Persons addicted to the habits of passion and ignorance have no chance of entering the higher planetary systems simply by an electronic mechanism. So this section is dealing with how people go to the higher planets, how they actually get up to the higher planets by pious activities. They have to be able to perform pious activities. And Maharaj Pariksit wants to understand that more. He wants to hear more about what kind of activities do you have to do to actually enter into higher planets. And Prabhupada explains about how people are demonic, that they build spaceships and they want to go there by mechanical means. Then he wants, Maharaj Pariksit wants to know about the creation of the universe, the sky, the planets, the stars, the mountains, the rivers, the seas, the islands, as well as their different kinds of inhabitants. How does that all take place? How, how does the creation all come about? He wants to know about different divisions of society, different qualities, people in different orders of life. He wants to know about the different ages in the duration of the creation, the duration of these different ages, and about the different activities of the incarnations of the Lord in different ages. Of course, that, that's something which actually comes in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, where you've got the the Pracheta is speaking with Maharaj Nini and you hear about the Lord's incarnations in each age. So from the purport of text 17, 
Maharaj Parikshit inquired from the great and learned sage Sukadeva Goswami about the different activities of such incarnations so that the incarnation of the Lord might be confirmed by his activities in the authorized scriptures. Maharaj Parikshit was not to be carried away by the sentiments of the common man to accept an incarnation of the Lord very cheaply. Instead, he wished to accept the incarnation of the Lord by symptoms mentioned in the Vedic literatures and confirmed by an Acharya like Sukadeva Goswami. And then, the Lord descends by his internal energy without any obligation of the laws of material nature and thus his activities are also uncommon. The specific activities of the Lord are mentioned. And one should know that the activities of the Lord and the Lord himself are identical due to being on the absolute plane. Thus, to hear the activities of the Lord means to associate with the Lord directly. And association with the Lord directly means purification from material activity. And so these are some nice quotes which we have in relation to the power of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. So Prabhupada is pointing out here that by hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, hearing about the activities of the Lord, we're directly associating with the Lord. And association with the Lord means we will get purified from material contamination. And in the other section we heard about the Lord's function in different... What, 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 well, why is Maharaj Pariksit asking about this? Why does he want to know about this? And Prabhupada points out it's important to know because we have to be able to recognize who are the genuine incarnations of the Lord. If we don't know, if the information is not there in the scriptures, then we don't know who is the real incarnation, who is the genuine incarnation, who is not. We have to depend on the authority of scriptures. And so this is scripture. Maharaj Parishad is asking this inquiry so that we can properly establish who are the real who is actually the incarnations? Who is God? And then, so, yes? Maharaj, in Canto, uh, Canto 2, Chapter 7, text number 3, when we, when we uh, recently had the topic scheduled in Galatians, in that Prabhupada was mentioning that there should be a name of the village and the name of the father and mother of the incarnation. So then it is proof that this is the incarnation of the Lord. Yes. That, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Yes, you're right. Then. So another one was like Lord Nursing Day. Lord Nursing Day, how? Mention is there in the scriptures, but name of the father, mother, village is not there. So, like, is it for some only? Like, Prabhupada was mentioning that it should be there, father, mother, and the village. Well, Lord Nishringadev, of course, you're not going to have a father and mother. <laughs> Lord Nishringadev appeared from the pillar. Just like, who's the, who's the father and mother of Matsya? Or who's, who, what about Lord Varaha? Who's the father and mother of Lord Varaha? Lord Varaha came from the nostril of Lord Brahma. So you have to understand, there are some exceptions, some very special incarnations of the Lord, which have, but, but they, are, they are described in the scriptures. And they, they have their very, very special form and manner of appearance. Thank you, 
Okay, just at the end of the purport there, Prabhupada writes, uh, uh, People following the principles of devotional service to the Lord can never be put into difficulty. And thus, there cannot be any question of, of apadharma or religion in distress, as will be explained in this book by the greatest authority, Sri Sukadeva Goswami. There is no religion save and accept the devotional service of the Lord, though this may be presented in different forms. So religion in distress, <laughs> apadharma. So we, we do see people come in distress, <laughs> Religion in distress. People come in distress. It's one of the reasons why people come to Krishna consciousness. But as soon as they come to Krishna consciousness, immediately the distress is removed. Krishna consciousness gives immediate relief from all kinds of material distress. So, people often are in distress. It's very common, Kali Yuga a lot of distress, but if they take shelter of devotional service, it can be relieved from all that distress. So Maharaj Parikshit wants to hear about the elementary principles of creation and the number of such elementary principles, their cause, their development, and the pro wants to know about the process of devotional service and the method of mystic power. What is the basic knowledge of the Vedic literature, including the branches of history and the supplementary Puranas? How can the perfect yogi become detached from the subtle astral body? So many questions Maharaj Parikshit has. Text 21, he brings up the point about pious acts. What, what is meant by pious activities? So these are described, you can see here in this purport, text number 21. Uh, pious activities, people like to take advantage to do pious activities. So what are actually pious activities? What is favorable? Here it's mentioned at the end of the purport, pious, pious acts are prescribed in the supplementary Vedas, Smritis, which specifically mention digging tanks, and wells for the water supply of the people in general. To plant trees on the public roads, to construct public temples and places of worship of God, to establish places of charity where the poor destitutes can be provided with foodstuffs and similar activities are all called purta or pious activities. Prabhupada also writes in the purport here, every devotee should be very enthusiastic, not only in performing his daily rituals of devotional service, but in trying to preach the cult peacefully by following in the footsteps of Lord Chaitanya. And Prabhupada goes on to talk, don't worry about being successful, you may not be successful, don't worry about it, but just try, that's the main thing. Krishna is pleased by the effort. The results are given by Krishna, you may get results, you may not, don't worry about it. A devotee should see to the right discharge of devotional service under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master and should not stick only to the formalities. 
of course, formalities, we, should, we have to follow formalities, but we have to know what is the principle. The details can be changed, but the principle, principle is to remember Krishna. So worship Krishna, you have to worship Krishna, you have to chant the holy name. You may go to the temple, you may not, but you have to you still have to chant. That's the point. So many questions are asked. He wants to know. The independent personality of Godhead enjoys his pastimes by his internal potency and at the time of annihilation gives them up for, to, the, to, the, to the external potency and he remains a witness to it all. So he says, kindly satisfy my inquisitiveness in all that I have inquired from you and all that I may not have inquired from you from the very beginning of my question. I am a soul surrendered unto you. Please impart full knowledge in this connection. Prabhupada's purport is nice. He says, uh, spiritual master is always prepared to impart knowledge to the disciple and specifically when the disciple is very inquisitive. Inquisitiveness on the part of a disciple is greatly necessary for the progressive disciple. Maharaj Parikshit is a typical disciple because he is perfectly inquisitive. If one is not very inquisitive about self-realization, one, one need not approach a spiritual master simply to make a show of discipleship. Not only is Maharaj Parikshit inquisitive concerning all he has inquired about, but he is also anxious to know about what he has not been able to inquire. Factually, it is not possible for a man to inquire about everything from the spiritual master. But the bona fide spiritual master is able to enlighten the disciple in every way for the disciple's benefit. So Prabhupada, Prabhupada in the beginning he would ask questions, he would take questions, but later on he stopped. He would just give classes and he would not bother so much about questions. He, he found the questions to be often challenging and foolish questions. But if devotee had questions, then they could write to Prabhupada and Prabhupada would res respond. But often we were encouraged not to trouble Prabhupada. We were told, let Prabhupada concentrate on writing his books. And if you have questions, you can write to your GBC, and the GBC will answer your questions. All right, going ahead. Uh, The six great sages mentioned above may be great thinkers, but their knowledge by mental speculation is not perfect. Who are these six great thinkers? Very good, yes, right, what we generally refer to as Sattarshan, right? The six different philosophical paths. Six different philosophical paths. Are you with us, Diksha? Yes, Maharaj. 
Do you know these six philosophical paths? Yes, Diksha? Uh, I recall when Premanan Gopinath Prabhu told I read it in half. Yes, Maharaj. So, which is the best of all the six philosophical paths? Maharaj, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, yeah. Not very well, but something over here. Anyway, there are different philosophical paths, right? You have Kapila, Sankhya philosophy, you have Patanjali, yoga philosophy, you have also Nyaya, Gotama, give the logic, and then you have also, uh, who else do we have? We have uh, Astavakra, Vaishashika, Kanada gave the Karma Mamamsa philosophy, Jaimini rather gave Karma Mamamsa philosophy. But the best of all the the best of all the philosophical systems is Vedanta from Srila Vyasadeva. So these different philosophical think, great thinkers, mental speculators are not perfect. However perfect an empiric philosopher may be in presenting a philosophical thesis, such knowledge is never perfect because it is produced by an imperfect mind. So such great sages, they may have also disciplic succession, but they are not authorized because such knowledge does not come directly from the Supreme Lord. So we have the, 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 the problem with mental speculation, that it's coming from the mind, from the imperfect senses, it's not perfect. Prabhupada writes uh, further, thus knowledge presented by material speculators is never transcendental and can never become perfect. Mundane philosophers, being imperfect in themselves, disagree with other philosophers because in themselves, being imperfect in themselves, mundane philosophers being imperfect in themselves disagree with other philosophers because a mundane philosopher is not a philosopher at all unless he presents his own, the his own theory. So intelligent people like Maharaj Pariksit do not recognize such mental speculators, however great they may be. So this is the superior position of the, the Vedanta philosophy because it comes from the Lord Himself. But the six darshans, the you know, Patanjali, and Karma Mimamsa, and Yoga, and Sankhya, and all, they're not perfect. All right, then Maharaj Pariksit continues. This is because of my drinking the nectar of the message of the infallible personality of Godhead, which is flowing down from the ocean of pure speeches, I do not feel any sort of ex exhaustion due to my fasting. So we know when we're fasting, we know it can be quite exhausted. But Maharaj Pariksit, he's not worried because he's hearing topics of Krishna, he's absorbed. Prabhupada writes, the mental speculators can present their theories very nicely by reason and argument, but such reasons and arguments are not infallible, for they are defeated by better mental speculators. So that is the problem with speculation. You will come up with a theory, someone will come up with another theory to defeat it. And Prabhupada also says, 
one can indulge in hearing the mental speculators, but such hearing cannot endure for any length of time. One will be exhausted very soon from hearing such hackneyed ways of thinking, and no one in the world can be satisfied simply by hearing such useless speculation. So Maharaj Parikshit asked all these questions, Sukadeva Goswami is very happy, happy to hear all these questions, very nice, wonderful things, he can understand, he is a very good student, someone who is really ready to hear. So text 28 describes, he began to reply by saying that the science of the Personality of Godhead was spoken first by the Lord himself to Brahma when he was first born. And Srimad Bhagavatam is the supplementary Vedic literature and it is in pursuance of the Vedas. And then the chapter concludes. He also prepared himself to reply to all that King Parikshit had inquired from him. Maharaj Parikshit was the best in the dynasty of the Pandus and thus he was able to ask the right questions from the right person. So that's the end of the chapter. Are there any questions? Well, tomorrow we're going to go on to chapter 9, Answers by Citing the Lord's Version, an important chapter because the Chatur Sloki Bhagavatam, the original verses, the Sikh verses of Srimad Bhagavatam, the four verses spoken by Lord Brahma, uh, by Lord Krishna to Lord Brahma are there. So we'll be hearing that. You can see Prabhupada's uh, lengthy purports are there to each of these verses. Okay, Chitahari Prabhu has a hand up. You have a question, Prabhu? Um, yes, uh, thank you Maharaj for explaining this whole chapter and there are so many nice questions asked by Maharaj Parikshit. In the, in some purport it came that it is very important for the progressive disciple. Inquisitiveness on the part of a disciple is great necessary for the progressive disciple. So, uh, uh, sometimes I feel that in the initial years of bhakti, that inquisitiveness is uh, at a higher level, but uh, gradually it goes down sometimes. So how we can maintain this attitude? Would you please throw some light on it? <laughs> yes, how to maintain an enthusiasm for putting questions well, simply by reading Prabhupada's books more and more, the more we read Prabhupada's books, I think the more questions we will have as we go on in Krishna consciousness. You know, as a new devotee, I really didn't have many questions. I didn't know very much to ask anything. But now I have a lot of questions, you know. I have more and more questions every day. There's new things I don't, I don't, I'd li I like to hear, like to know about them. But it, it's, it just, it's just something which happens naturally as we go on reading Prabhupada's books and hearing Krishna consciousness. More and more points come up which we're not very clear about. We want to be in, understand more fully. And so. Uh, we, we, we just have to keep conti continually hearing and uh, remembering the philosophy. The more we think, the more we think about the philosophy, remember, remember what we read. I mean, 
naturally doubts will, different points will come up which we want to question, which we want to understand. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you can also do like what we would call being a, the devil's advocate. Devil's advocate, you know, you, you, you come up with some atheistic philosophy. You say, well, it says like this, but you know, there's a lot of people who don't believe that. You know, you're saying this, but you know, how can we believe all this, you know? And so, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's good to also be like the, the devil's advocate. It makes it interesting, you know, to ask these kind of questions which uh, where we doubt the philosophy. We doubt, you know, I, I think it's, you know, most people are not going to accept this. How can we present, how can we expect people to believe this? So, we can ask these kind of questions. Uh, I heard Maharaj Prabhupada used to sometimes do that with his disciples when he used to travel. He used to, uh, you know, try to uh, uh, discuss or, you know, in a debate with them so that they can learn how to defeat the arguments of the non-devotees. Yes, sometimes Prabhupada would be the impersonalist, sometimes he would ask the devotees to defeat him, sometimes he'd be the devotee and he'd ask you know, the devotees to be the impersonalist. Sometimes Prabhupada would be the impersonalist himself and the devotees would challenge him. Yeah, Prabhupada was constantly doing these kind of things to encourage the devotees. He wanted them all to be able to, to present the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. And it's actually written in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that when Lord Chaitanya was dancing in Benares, the Mayavadi sannyasis were just, they were uh, saying Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is just a sentimentalist. And so it's mentioned that Chandrasekhar and Tapana Mishra were Kanista Adhikaris because they were not able to defeat the Mayavadi thought. They were not able to actually establish the actual position of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who himself confronted the Mayavadi sannyasis and then they could understand his actual position. So it's important for us to know the philosophy and to be able to present it to people. Although we, we don't like to just go around arguing with people. We have to be careful. We don't want to just argue. But if people are actually interested, gen genuinely interested, then we can give more time to them and discuss with them. Yes, Mahaj. Yes, Dhananjaya Prabhu? Thank you, Mr. Mahaj. So, from chapter 7, uh, verse 37, there's the Buddha in present is Buddha. So this Buddha which is being referred in Bhagavatam, he came in which Kalpa? Because that is not mentioned. There. It's not the mentioned. Book. Just mentioned it was in another Kalpa, in another Kali Yuga. Uh, so then another thing is, uh, he is also referring that Maya Sur has created an invisible uh, rocket and with uh, which uh, uh, people are being annihilated, uh, and and so uh, so those people like Lord Buddha preached about ahimsa. That is what it is being referred. So how come that uh, those people who are uh, uh, doing such a heinous crime, they are uh, being liberated, and it is almost amounts to that in present day somebody is. Uh, 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 drop a nuclear bomb which is also individual and uh, cleans up the whole humanity but uh, still people uh, getting uh, uh, delivered so how we correlate Maharaj this such heinous crime with the liberation well yeah who's getting liberated people who take advantage people who surrender even though one may be the most sinful person but if he takes shelter of the holy name of the Lord, if he approaches the lotus feet of the Lord, they can be delivered. 
Lord Rama said, you know, anybody who chants my holy name even one time, I will, I will never give them up. I will give them protection. I will make them fearless. I will free them. Lord Rama promised anyone who just takes his holy name one time, who utters the name, he will give them shelter. And Krishna also said in Bhagavad Gita, if you, if, you, if you give up all your material religiosity and just surrender to me, I will free you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. So the word, yes. of, the word of the Lord is there. Look at Jagai and Madhai. They were the most sinful people. They, they had done all kinds of atrocities. But they were delivered and made into great devotees. And they're part of the tree of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And they never again did anything sinful. Yes, at least they have accepted the devotional path. But this Buddha is not teaching about devotional part. The only teaching want to stop doing this violence. Somebody whole life was doing violence, just stop doing violence. So how come uh, such persons who has done accumulated past uh, uh, reactions of their karma uh, is being nullified and spread away, it is being uh, uh, liberated. Well, that's a part of the Lord. By his compassionate nature, he can deliver them from all kinds of hell. Lord Krishna, the Supreme Lord, the Personality of Godhead in his different forms, even as Lord Buddha, he can deliver the sinful people. So according to their qualification, you know, Lord Buddha is a little different. He's just simply teaching them uh, nonviolence. But they have that faith. They have that somehow. They have that faith in him. They're drawn to him, and they take shelter of him and they follow him. So certainly they've been liberated. The, the Buddha of present Kalpa, he also taught about the nonviolence. So does it mean that? The, those people who are practicing non-violence, of course, the, most of the Buddhists, they don't practice uh, uh, non-violence. But if somebody is practicing non-violence, that was in the beginning of uh, uh, Buddhist era. So are they going to deliver in this uh, Kalpa also? Well, what does it mean to be delivered? Lib what does liberation mean? Liberation means now they're qualified. You can, one meaning of liberation means now they're qualified to take up devotional service. So it's not they're going to go back to Godhead. But now they're, they're, they're free of the, the, the material energy. They have an opportunity to come to a higher level, to go on to something better. They're freed from their ignorance and passion. So there are different ways in which we can understand what liberation actually means. So this liberation is different from the cycle of getting out the cycle of birth and death. This is just moving on the higher planet where he can... Uh, but the higher planet definitely is going to get... Uh, 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 more opulences and less uh, chances of doing bhakti. So that means uh, that is also not good for him. So how it is going to in a better situations than what is there? Well, this. better situation means that just like impersonalists, my bodies, you know, they can go to Brahma Jyoti. They may enter into Brahma Jyoti. So something I said, the Buddhists, they also go like to a similar place where Lord Shiva resides. Sometimes it's also said they, they go to the Vairaja river between the material and spiritual world and they take a bath there and then they come back into the material world. So like that. Because similar kind of philosophy, even this, there are many paths, like one is in Pune, which is called Osho philosophy, which... Uh, 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 across the world, people are still following it. And they also uh, try to misguide them about similar offer. Their whole process is something mixture of uh, uh, Buddhism.
what is philosophy uh, only and and they also try to misguide that they will be going into the brahm jyoti so probably these are all hoax isn't it Maharaj? yes i said and you think it's so easy thing to go into the brahma jyoti not so easy they have to be without material desire of course lord krishna he can arrange to deliver people when he kills them you know they can be liberated to the impersonal but not krishna doesn't just kill anyone and only special people they're worthy of lord krishna they're worthy of the death blow from lord krishna so only certain souls and then in chapter 8 uh, one of the purpose purpose was which we discussed in the class also today that liberated liberated soul should only accept a disciple if he can able to deliver them but here uh, a probe is uh, accepting these disciples uh, uh, who has been falling apart or even after uh, uh, initiations he was even teaching about this uh, uh, for, for uh, yama uh, so how we understand like uh, it is the instruction of uh, the spiritual master is even more important than uh, this uh, what Prabhupada said about this uh, how, how to accept this disciple because many of the disciples is uh, has, has uh, left the movement also uh, later on but definitely he is not going to be delivered uh, or, or still those people who have left the uh, movement and still since once Prabhupada has accepted, accepted them as a disciple they are also going to get liberated because uh, um, this is how the Prabhupada writes it well they come to Krishna consciousness, they, if they do some service, they get some benefit according to how much service they did. If they came up, came into the Krishna consciousness movement and they did some service in proportion to the service which we, they've rendered, certainly they'll be benefited. So that benefit, even though they may give up Krishna consciousness at some point, after some time they will again be able to continue, they may take it up again come back, maybe not in this lifetime, maybe the next lifetime, but they will come back. Because the devotion, whatever service they've done for Krishna, the benefit is never lost. So we have that faith that someone did some service for Krishna. He may have given up the process due to some material attachments, weak-heartedness, but after, an, in some future life, they'll come back again, they'll be attracted to again continue. Yes, my Thank you. Thank you. Diksha? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, one devotee asked me a question, what is the meaning of always remembering Krishna and not forgetting Krishna? Is it not? Always remembering Krishna means that we'll never forget Krishna. So one uh, devotee asked me, so I was not answerable. Yeah. I want to ask Maharaj, what is the meaning? Like, is it not same? Yes, yeah, same, pretty much. Always remember Krishna, never forget him. Yeah. <laughs> always, well, certainly, we want to always remember to chant Hare Krishna. And while we're chanting Hare Krishna, we don't want to forget Krishna. So yes, it's definitely you could understand it, the same thing. I, I've never really thought about it. I'll have to think more about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, always, but not a, a not a great difference between remembering and not forgetting him. Anybody, anyone has an answer to this? Yes, Chira Hari Prabhu. I have a question, Maharaj. Oh, you have a question. Okay, what's your question, Prabhu? Um, as a, as a 
I was thinking that uh, spiritual master takes the disciple's responsibility. Like Prabhupada says that one who can deliver his disciple, he should become a spiritual master. But I was thinking at the same time, all the spiritual master has the ability, but it is a two-way game. Like disciple also has to follow the instruction. Only then the spiritual master will take the responsibility. Is it like that? Yes, definitely. Disciple have to, they have to submit, one has to surrender to the instruction of the spiritual master. That is part of the process of accepting a spiritual master. You have to be obedient to his instructions. Third offense in chanting the holy name, to disobey the order of the spiritual master. So yes, we have to be very attentive to follow the orders of the spiritual master. Uh, so Maharaj, my question in regard to the ritual, I felt it is, it is like contract, like if one party breaks the contract, there is a breach of contract, other party is not responsible to follow his commitment, like disciple breaks the commitment, then the spiritual master is not liable to take him back to our hand. Yes. But it is also said that. It is also said, uh, may I continue, Maharaj? Yeah, go ahead. It is also said that uh, the spiritual master comes back again and again in this material world until all his disciples are delivered. So would you please explain these both points? Well, I don't know that Srila Prabhupada ever said that, that he would come back again and again until all the disciples are delivered. Where do you get that from? I've never heard, I heard it. I've, I heard it from some devotees. I've never heard it. I don't know where it's from. But Srila Prabhupada, you, you can read in the relation to the pastime of Dhruva Maharaj going back to Godhead, and Dhruva Maharaj wanted to make sure his mother was also going back to Godhead. And so Prabhupada writes about how he said he hopes in the same way that my disciple will also take me back to Godhead. He said, if I can have a disciple, one, one disciple by the strength of one disciple, he can take me back to God. Just like Dhruva Maharaj made sure his mother went back to Godhead. He said, I also pray that my disciples will also help me to go back to Godhead. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Maharaj, uh, so there are different ways to understand this. Yeah, generally we do say the spiritual master delivering the disciple from material existence and at the time of initiation he promises to help that person to go back to Godhead. So yes, there's a contract. The contract is written at the time of initiation. When we take vows, we follow four principles. We promise to chant sixteen rounds. So we ha that's the contract. We have to follow the terms of the contract. If we don't follow these principles, if we're not doing what we're supposed to do, then the spiritual master is not obliged. So we have to be obedient to the order of the spiritual teacher. We have to be faithful to the conditions of initiation. Mm -hmm. Yes, some, this is another question here, is it? Who is it? Oh, the Premananda Gopinath, yes. One of the purposes of Gopinath is that Goswami was protected by Lord Krishna, and therefore he acknowledged Brahma Rathav, and it is mentioned in Brahma Bhagavad Gita. So, how and when Gopinath protected? How was Sukadev Goswami protected by Lord Krishna? Uh, well, when he was with, within the womb of the mother, Lord Krishna came there and preached to him that he should come out, that he should come out and preach Srimad Bhagavatam, that he should come out. He, Lord Krishna came there and I think with it, he recited the Srimad Bhagavatam and on hearing Srimad Bhagavatam then Sukadeva Goswami left the womb. 
I think it may, may be referring to that, in that, in that sense that Sukadeva Goswami was protected by the Lord. I don't know of any other example. I don't have a copy of that Brahma Vaivarta Purana. If anybody has a copy, you may be able to refer to it. It's Brahma Vaivarta Purana, right? Yeah. I'll see if I can get it, if, in, if I can find a, a copy on it on the internet, maybe we can look and see what's there, what, what they're referring to. Eight twenty-six, is it? Okay. Eight twenty-seven. Okay. Yes, any other questions? Okay, so then we'll go on tomorrow. We're going to go on chapter number nine. Please have a look over the text. Okay. Yes? Any any other points? No? Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Or back to Vrinda Ki Jai. Good Pramanande. Recording stopped.